Okay, so here we are today. Uh, this being November 2nd. No, 2nd, yes. 2018, and this being the Grande Pacific Model Railroad. This is Silverville right here. Um, this is the town of Silverville and all of its industries and so forth. What we're getting ready to do, and we spent some time this morning, the crew being this being a meat work day, and we cleaned out underneath everything that was back here, extra wood and so forth. This is going to be a staging yard or additional storage yard for the railroad. So we're going to try to take you step by step on building this. Uh, now, this is an addition into this railroad. So some of the things we do may not apply to what you do, but believe me, what you're going to see over the coming weeks uh, and maybe months uh, on this edition are all the things you're going to need to do uh, when you build the railroad. And the first thing we're looking at right now, and we're going to start working on here shortly, is lighting. Now, this railroad's lighting system up underneath, as you see it, is uh, early 21st century. Um, it's only 10 years old, but guess what? It's obsolete. So, uh, you're actually looking at the last few remaining incandescent light bulbs left on this layout. Uh, but underneath here, we're going to go to low voltage LED light strip. So that'll be the first thing you'll see us do and install it because before we go put the uh, section in here which will be 28 inches off the floor what you're looking at right now is 40 inches off the floor. The staging storage area will be 28. We're damn sure going to install the lighting up underneath the bottom of the Silverville before we do anything. Uh, a lot of things will be done, uh, as you will see, without the actual installation of the whole thing. What we intend on doing is the same thing you see here. We're just going to double it over to the other side. Uh, we need some places to put some trains that run now and then. And then, believe me, people, best taking them uh, where well, you don't take them in and out of boxes. So we need some places to set them down on track. Okay, so our project is started here for a piece under Silverville. And we are uh, went over today and we have purchased our uh, lumber to make the 32 by 30 inch wide frame. And the little pieces over here are going to be the braces to hold it up off the wall, which we'll show you all that. The straight pieces are uh, better quality wood. Uh, we paid about $10 a piece for them. They're one by four uh, by 12 feet long. Two of those together are going to give me 24, and then we'll have to fill, I bought an extra piece to fill in in the end, because we'll have to kind of design a little frame there. But you'll see that all as we go along. So that was a trip to, uh, and unfortunately in this case, Home Depot had a much better price on the uh, pieces of wood. Now what Lee's got in his hand, these are the stringers, 28 and a half inches long. And those, that piece of wood, those come out of pieces of wood like so. I can't turn the phone. This is, a, you can't do that. All right, this is pieces of wood that are uh, two or two ninety eight a piece. One by four by eight, and this is not quality lumber. Uh, but you can't get but three pieces out of each one, so you can allow for having bad ends. Because you can cut off six or eight inches, you're going to have left over. So you, you can work all this out, and you end up with good-looking stringers, and we'll go from here. Now, having a saw, chop saw like this, uh, believe me, people, this makes this like shooting fish in a rain barrel. So um, just remember this, and I will say it again. You must have safety glasses on and understand how to use this saw before you start trying to use one. Because all saws like this are very much safety issues. 
I wear plastics, glasses, so, man, we just had a case where we cut through a, a, a staple that was still in the wood and it fell out. And I could have kicked back, and that's why you have things like safety glasses on. So, remember to think safety. Now, we did this a long time ago. Saw us mounted up, it rolls in and out, and it sits in the garage over there. Okay, so it's a, it's a convenient tool. So we're going to move on here. We need to make up 20 of these at least. And then after that, we're going to go punch the holes in them for the wires. Okay, and then that we have to, dis we have to mark them all for the top. And we have to mark them so all the holes are going the same. When we put them in the frame... They're all going the same way. So the holes all line up. Okay. So we'll show you that as we go. So that piece laying on top is my template. 28 and a half inches long. Now, on the outside of that piece, we're going to have two one by fours. So that's going to make my 30 inches up. Uh, if you've followed along on the Grande Pacific, you know that 90% of the bench work is, well, I won't say it, but... 60% of the bench work is 30 inches deep. 30 inches is the limit on reach. Okay. Uh, we get inside, we'll point that out again. But this is the template. So lay it down on the board, and that gives me, when I cut it, they all come out exactly the same. You don't have to measure and try to line it up. We're cutting them all to one. If it was off a sixteenth of an inch, they're all off a sixteenth of an inch, and that's basically the way you want it. Now, on top of this, we're only putting a piece of plywood that's two feet wide, and we'll explain that as we go along. Okay, so we missed the part yesterday uh, when we were cutting. The next step after cutting was uh, punching the holes. Now, this was done with an electric drill, not a battery-operated drill, because this takes a little bit of guts to get this done real quick. Uh, each one of these, and this is the template. Uh, all, this is a long-time template. Built this whole railroad with this template. That shows you where the holes go in each board. Now, depending on what you're going to do and how you like to do it, you can put more holes in but these are three quarter inch holes done with a spay bit with a power drill. We clamped three together and did them three at a time. The last one we did four. The little black marks on the top mark the top and the black line marks the front edge. That way all the holes line up people. Okay. When you see us go through this today, there's a reason for all this. So this is your pieces uh, for the inside they're 28 and a half inches wide and this will be a 30 inch piece of bench work wide piece of bench work because <gasps> those two pieces of wood are a half inch wide and we will proceed with this so you will see the reason all the holes are punched uh, we did it outside this creates a significant mess when you take a three-quarter inch spay bid and start drilling holes through three of these at a time. So the mess was done outside. My dad born probably 1950. All right, so what we're going to do now, these are 12 one-by-fours fur gray lumber. They're, this is fairly good lumber. It's not top quality, but this is straight uh, good quality lumber. There's no big cuts, grooves, grooves, or anything out of it. This is going. One of these faces is going to end up here on the outside. This you need something that's pretty good quality because it kind of sets the tone for the whole thing. Now, on this end, I have laid out what is known in the industry as a framing square. The idea here is we're going to set 16-inch marks. Now. This is going back here at the same level you see that piece of one by two on the wall. I first checked, because I know where all the studs are, to make sure that I could get to the piece to screw it into the wall back there in the corner 
as it turns out that the stud is at about 14 inches from the corner. The rest of the studs all hit at 16 inches. My main concern when I put this together, can I get to a flat port of the board to run the screw into the stud in the wall uh, and not have a cross the member in the way. So we have determined that we can mount this up and have the first cross section will not interfere with the placement of the screws as we go all the way down. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through here and mark off the uh, 16 inch centers. As you see, I've done right there. We'll make it come all the way across. We have marked the boards to where we have top, top, because you got to keep that, you want to create the, you want to create a situation where you have the least bow in the board. Because you're going to take all that out as you screw all this together, and particularly once you put the plywood on top of it. But this is a way to uh, make sure you want to check these things in the beginning to eliminate as many problems as you can. Okay, so leaves down there holding at the end up. These are all screwed down here. So we have all the tops, as you can see by our little marks, on each one in the same place, okay? So, when in this is marked as the top edge, this is the top edge, you can see down there on that one, if you look close, it says top. Now, two screws, inch and five eighths long screw. Now, absolute must, you must pre-drill the hole okay so we have one screw here we're going to go over here and we're going to make sure that's in the center it's the bottom it makes no difference if it sticks out a little bit do not drill right at the edge left-handed drilling is not my sport but we'll get this okay so we drill the hole Gonna set the drill down that one. And because I only have one hand, we're gonna come back, stick the screw in a hole, and then we're gonna take the drill with the big drill. Don't need one this big for this job, but this is it. And then we're gonna take this drill, which has a screwdriver bit in it, and we're gonna screw it in. So you have two screws on each one. This stops any twisting. Now, it is critically important. These be exactly 90 degrees. If not, any angle gets projected up to anything else you add on to them. So we're about reaching, and this is, believe me, not more than about 15 minutes work here. We're just about to finish the assembly on one side of the first section. So, on we go, be back. Okay, so that's the first section built. We marked out the next section. This time we figured out, we've got the marks on the outside, which is gonna be the, the front, so we can, the top's right, so we can see the marks, not have to redo them. Okay, so no big deal. And there's our uh, struts for there, so. Time to get the second piece put together. And we're going down here. So specifically, what eventually will happen is that this staging yard will be tied into that track right there, which is the reversing loop on the other end of Junction Yard, which will give us a place to keep some trains that we run. Okay, so moving ahead here. Okay, so we got the two sections put together that are going to be used here uh, as far as the grid. I'll have the holes for the wires. Uh, again, inch and five eighths drywall core screws. Now, the plywood, this gets a little expensive now. This is good cabinet grade for plywood. Uh, 
it's worth the money in the long run because it gives you the base you need. And we've screwed one eight. We had a, these are two sheets, four by eight, cut in half. So we screwed it down and leave six inches in the back, which we need back there to be able to get to the screws and put the braces from up the top on and then attach braces going the other braces in the, into this. So we've screwed one, two, that's two feet by eight foot piece of plywood down. We've unpacked the cork. Now we're going to roll the cork out and we're going to flatten it all out. Then we're going to set another piece of plywood on top of it to try to take some of the curve out of it before we try to start gluing any of it down. That's the reason why we have it all laying out here so we can uh, stretch it out and try to get the uh, uh, something on top of it so, and leave it sit there for a while until tomorrow or whatever. So anyway, this is where we're at on this project. Now, the cork came from Hobby Lobby. It is um, 5 uh in thickness. It's a little thinner than standard railroad cork, but it, it basically with the 40% off coupon in use, it's about $10 a roll. So uh, don't know what the total bill here is, but it's a lot cheaper than trying to use railroad cork. And remember, all this is going to be one big flat yard, so this is all we need. Uh, I have no plans at this point to ballast, paint, or do anything to this yard. Uh, we may paint the rails, but that'll be about it. So, there it is. We've spread the glue, and we've used the... Uh, spread a device with the edges to get it even this is going to be you're going to have to trial and error to get this uh, right this isn't put a little bit of glue on uh, i can tell you people you gotta you have to have a pretty good coat of glue on here for all this to work so we got all the glue on we spread it out now gotta work fast don't have all the time in the world it's not drying that fast but we've got the glue on so uh, now we're going to uh, have a wet rag. We got it so we can't get any on the carpet and uh, necessary clean equipment. So now I'm going to put the cork on and then we'll clamp it. And I'll show you how we'll do that. I'm by myself this morning, so I can't record the uh, placing of the cork. But uh, you just need to get it. We, in this case, all we're going to do is make sure we have it straight with the front edge. Okay, we've gotten the, the uh, cork on the glue. Uh, we have a little glue extra on the edge here. We're going to wipe that off. But first of all, the next step is to start clamping. First thing I got to do before I clamp is put wax paper on this. You don't put some between your boards or whatever you're going to clamp with in the cork. You're going to come back and find out that the glue came up through the cork and your boards are glued to the cork and it makes a grand mess lesson learned the hard way okay uh we now have the cork and um, excuse me the wax paper we got the wax paper put in place and now we're going to screw the boards on this is one that's going to act as a clamp got that piece and we have another piece over here uh we can use uh and that's to make sure because right now it's curled up it's pulled off the board at the ends and there are places that uh, are not flat so you got to clamp it down with something until it dries uh, my idea here is we'll clamp this down and we'll leave it here probably six or eight hours before we try to do anything else as far as putting the next piece on after that the brick sitting on the ends there to try to flatten the ends out okay so uh we have uh, completed clamping this Various pieces of lumber we had laying around. Those were inch and a quarter screws. Uh, I guess there's other ways you could do it. Uh, but this works for me. And we will come back here in six or eight hours. And or maybe even tomorrow morning. And remove this and then move on down here and put another four foot section in. We uh, basically are about an inch and a half short. We cut off the other end because, well, it was torn. But it's not a, it, this will make it so that I don't end up with cork seams on seams. 
Not a good idea. Best if you have something going over a seam on the plywood because I don't plan on backing the, the seam hit here right on the 16 inch mark. So uh, might have to back when we get to the other section, but we'll see when we get there. But anyway, uh, the next one, as you can see, there's a, the screws there at the end or actually the end of four feet. So we're gonna be tucking in a little bit. That'll leave a little bit on the end down there, which is fine. That's exactly what we want. That way we have overlap, not on top of a plywood seam. So dry, don't get in a rush, people. Gotta let it dry, and I'm uh, gonna say it one more time. You gotta have something in there between that cork and that whatever you use to hold it down or weight it down. I use wax paper. So anyway, here we are. We're finished with the uh, first just about four foot long piece of cork. Like I said, that one we had to, we trimmed it off here on the end. Uh, I took my uh, handy dandy exacto knife and trimmed it off. And now it's nice and straight. And that's not sticking out. So it'll butt up against the wall. Okay, so we're going to add another four foot section of cork here onto our project board thing here. This is the top of the new yard. Um, now, I'm going to say here just quickly, I, I don't know how much I covered because we broke this in between with the LED lighting. Uh, yeah, if... Uh, you had homosode here. This would work fine too. Uh, homosode would be to be maybe the first choice. Uh, it's just it was easy enough to get this cork, and uh, I actually had a couple of rolls of this, and bought up, bought some more. But uh, I guess if it was going to be starting all over from scratch, uh, there might have been some more homosode put into this project. But this works good. Uh, as a thing, I, I do not use foam anywhere underneath the uh, roadbed. Uh, there's enough studies been done on uh, foam. You see people add foam and say, well, well let's quiet things down. The minute you ballast your track, all of that is neutralized. The foam, the plywood, everything, all becomes a big sounding board once you have put ballast down and glued it. There were several detailed tests done on it, and the difference was in the tents. So, and when you get into decimals of noise. So, you know, uh, foam is too, I use foam extensively for scenery on this layout. Jesus, every video I use, but I don't use foam underneath the, lay, underneath the track. It's on this layout, it's cork, and I'll say, Homoso would be my uh, next choice, particularly in yard areas like this. But uh, it's uh, cork is what we're using here, and this is sheet cork, uh, five sixty fourths, I believe, is the total measurement thickness. Comes in two when you go to Hobby Lobby. This comes in two, two by eight or two by four. The two by four they both sell for the same amount, but the two by four is thicker. That's the difference. So let's get some glue down here and get this process going here. So we've applied some white glue. We're going to use the uh, spatula device to spread it around. Uh, a big flat putty knife works real well too, but you got to get glue on every part of that area. And then we'll pull the cork over. Uh, so we've got this covered in glue. Uh, spread around pretty good. Uh, this doesn't dry real fast, so you have time to fool with it. Please note the mess. There's a lot of glue running over the front. That's why you see the towels and stuff. No, so why we have a wet rag. So now we're going to go clean up the mess so we don't drag it into everything uh, as we walk around here. And then we're going to lift that piece of cork and put it here over the top. 
should have drawn a line down here on this end because I know it doesn't come all the way to the end. But that's all right. We got it close. Again, we put the wax paper down and we're getting ready to clamp the whole thing down. If the, the seam right there, the, you can see the white even through the white wax paper where the glue comes up on the seam. You didn't have the wax paper there and you try to clamp it with the board. You come back tomorrow morning and your board's going to be glued to the cork and you got a big problem. So that's what the wax paper does. It stops the glue from getting on that bottom of that board, which is going to be our clamp, which you'll see here in a minute. Here we have it all clamped, wax paper over the cork, the glue, the plywood, the glue, the wax paper, the cork. It's all there. All clamped down with the boards. See you tomorrow morning. Uh, this is about 5.30 in the evening. And uh, we'll just leave this like this overnight. Okay, so now we've finished the uh, cork. Uh, except for whatever the section is between where that switch will go right there and that end. And there's probably going to be a couple of switches in between because one thing you learn about railroading and, and it applies to the big ones and the scale model ones, when you start building a throat uh, with switches, uh, it takes up a lot of space. So we're going to try to compound this ladder on the switches. So we have some going left, some going right. And that way we won't have just a ladder uh, of switches. And that should save us some space. So anyway, the, here is our uh, 24 foot long section with the uh, 1530 second plywood on the, like over here you see that piece, that's what I had left over. Four by eight sheets of 1530 second and this is furniture grade stuff. So anyway uh good smooth plywood then we start glued the cork on and uh finished clamping and, and, and basically did a section that's four feet long uh we did a section each day so each day it'd come out here and knock out one go on and do some other things but uh we've now gotten all the way to the end now the next thing is we're going to get down take that big level that so the process of laying track and uh, filling up the yard, uh, and this again is a storage yard. I want to say this right here. Everything that I'm doing in this video doesn't make any difference how big or how small your railroad is. Or everything applies. Um, this is two-inch track centers. Um, it's tight for a yard. That's two inch track centers, okay? So uh, getting fingers in between there can, is not the easiest thing in the world. But in the hobby, and particularly when I, you're dealing with that Atlas track, which is what I do here, the entire system is built on two inch track centers. So when you lay out a compound ladder like this, a ladder, and this is not compound, it's just a ladder. You, and you set it all at the right angles and degrees and everything, the switch turn of these are number fours, it comes out at two-inch centers. Okay. Now, this is part of this project. Uh, we're in the process now. We're all the way down here at the end on the staging yard of laying track. This little demonstration right here, this applies to any time you're laying track and you're doing a long straight run. You notice the big six foot uh, uh, level. It's got a big metal straight edge on it. So when I come down here, you can see I've got the nails kind of pushed into the cork. I nail it down. It may be two years a year from now, if I was going to ballast this area, this would get ballasted. 
We put the rail joiners on, and you notice we've removed the two ties. This is, happens to be Atlas Code 100 track. Uh, we accumulated this from someplace. God, God knows where, but I got enough of it to do a couple of these tracks, so I'm going to use it. It's a staging yard. It's not going to be seen. So it makes great. It's the most inexpensive track, so it'll, make, it'll work just fine back here. But when we go along... Go down here, I'll put the first nail in all the way down at the end. If you see, as you go along, you you have to pull, the, the level is up against the edge down there, and it's up against the edge here. But sometimes you watch, you see the track isn't touching, so you have to hold it over. You see a nail hole. Well, we're going to put a nail in there, and then we'll we'll drive it in. Uh, when I say wait a couple of, a year, uh, the problem with this is this is all new wood. It, you know, there's moisture in it. Now, okay, this is in the south, way south. I'll put it this way: I'm about 15 miles from the Gulf of Mexico here. Humidity is always high here. Uh, no, and I don't keep the air conditioners running. Uh, too expensive. So the wood's got to dry out. You know, we'll run into periods of time, but it'll dry out, which means everything here is going to shrink. Is it noticeable to the human eye? No. But that little track right there, it's enough to affect it. Plus the fact that you get expansion and contraction on it. Now, the track is open at the end. That's not touching that piece of wood. And then actually that piece of wood is not there. I just, I'm leaving, I'm using it as a gauge. Because I want to put a bumper down there. And I will build in, once we get this all in place, I'll go back there. And I'll put a bumper with a piece of foam on the end of it. So in case somebody gets carried away and pushes cars back too far, there will be a stop. Uh, but in the track is on all of these will be open at the end. So if I have track expansion, it will push back and off the end. So I won't have kinking on this track. But if that was closed, say there was a switch at each end, where the um, track is captured, you could end up with kinking and you'd have to go solve that. And the way you solve it is you cut the track and gap, uh, remove some of it and close it back up, just like the real railroad does. But anyway, a metal edge to get a good, to have good straight track is a necessity. The little black lines are straight, but you're not going to get it all lined up. Again, this is the hand. If you just, you have the metal edge, you push against that edge, do it, put the nail in place. Or if you're gluing the track down, which a lot of people like to do, you got to have some way to get this thing straight. And the human eye isn't going to do it, okay? You're going to have to have something to do it with. In addition to the uh, track laying in, we've done the first two sections here. Uh, tools. You got some of the track dikes. Uh, we have a couple pairs of these we've picked up on. And you have to, one of them we mark it, track only. You, you got to watch people don't grab these things and use them for something else. Uh, you, they have to have, I'm trying to get this to focus. You gotta really have good. You can't have any gaps in them. This is a case of somebody who uses these for something else. Let's see if I can get it turned over here. Notice the there. That shows you right there. Uh, it has holes in it. So like they've get bitten into it with something and um, ruined the cutting edge. So you gotta watch where your tools get used at. Bare needle nose pliers, track nails. Now, you know, 
Those, this is the second time around on the track nails. They were used somewhere else in this lab. Because where I have track that's laid in ballast, I go back and pull the track nails out. Uh, a lot of the trains are going to go in here. Some of them are on the railroad already. And it just gives us more wiggle room. Some of the trains that are on here will go in here, uh, or cars, or trains that are in boxes. By putting the trains and the cars into a, onto a track and a place that they can be run in and out of, it removes putting your hands on them and take them and putting them on and off the railroad. Every time you do that, take them on or put them on, or take them on and off the railroad, they get damaged. And the place, best place for your cars is on the railroad, on a track, and do as many things as you possibly can do not to have people touch them. I have a video on those things right there. Those are KD, these are all KD couplers, and that's a KD magnet. And I have a whole video on tips and tricks on how to do the KD thing. It stops people from touching cars. Okay, so now we're getting the next section of track ready. This is, a, again, Atlas track, three feet long. It's not uh, like the uh, Shinnehara track down there, which I got from somebody. That's 39 inches long. It's a, it's a meter. So, anyway, we have the next track section. You have to cut. If you take a regular section, the way it comes out the box... Uh, bad choice. Got to get another one in. Uh, not a full length, but that's the way it would come with the ties on both ends. You have to cut the last tie off, then put your rail joiners on, like so. Uh, clean up the ends on the rail joiners so they don't stick over. And I have both ends on. See, I have a box of rail joiners here. Uh, one of my great eBay purchases uh, 10 years ago. I had three boxes of them like this. <laughs> Sometimes you get lucky. Okay. Uh, you put your rail joiners on. Now it's code 100 rail joiners. Uh, this is the way you buy them right here today. Uh Code, it's a universal rail joint item number 170 from the world famous Atlas Model Train Company. Uh, but that's the rail joint of being used. Uh, now, in this case, uh, normally after uh, a six months to a year, I would go back and solder all these rail joiners. Um, due to the fact that probably electric Engine, the engines will not run back here on this end. Most of the trains will get backed in. And because of the possibility at some time in the future, uh, someone may come in here and take this whole thing apart, we're not going to solder these rail joiners. We'll just let them sit where it is. But now this section is ready to go in place. So that's our next move. And, you know, in a case like this, you could get a couple of people to help you do various stages of this and set up an assembly line. Believe me, uh, it would help a lot. But uh, we're going to keep plugging away here. And this is kind of step-by-step, lane track 101. Um, this is the current staging yards at the uh, Grande Pacific. Uh, distance off the floor here is 28 inches. The uh, operating level first one is 40 inches. But this is uh, golden staging here. Now, you have to run through the middle track. Takes you down. This is the main line. And it comes down here to the Union Passenger Terminal. Which is at the end where all the passenger trains are. And then you go around the end and you come to Junction, which is the west end of the railroad. Uh, that's the end on the west side. Uh, 
Um, we have three tracks for what in the JMRI system is staged uh, trains. And then we have three tracks in the front that are basically this is a yard. And then in the back we have some run, run through trains, uh, coal train, and there's some the Tropicana train and so forth. So what we've basically done, and uh, kind of obvious by the pictures, run out of space. Well, the, the loop here goes through the wall, as you can see in the back corner of the picture, and it comes around and comes out here. So we turn all the trains and usually back them in. Well, that's come through here, and that's the loop here on the bottom of the uh, scenery in the front of the layout. And this is the loop coming back through the wall. Well, that's where the new staging yard, the switch will go right there. We're going to kind of get into how we, some of the things you have to do to lay track. Um, track cutting dikes, they're nice. Some track nails. Um, now, on the Atlas track, if you get a new piece like this is, it's never been used, and you're going to use nails, you're going to find out, oh, guess what? Where's the holes? Uh, you turn it over, and there is the little hole. Indentation. Indicator. There's another one. So there's another one. So then you take the trusty drill with the very small bit on it, and you go down here, and let's see if we can find one right here. Put the drill in, thing, and we pop right through. And I'm going to have to knock that off. Okay, so you have to go down each piece of track and drill out the little holes. Uh, now, what I usually do is I like, I'll get four or five pieces lined up here because the holes all match on the track and I'll do four or five pieces at a time. So once you've gotten the holes punched and everything else, then you got to get your rail joiners on, get ready, and then you have a piece of track. What I do is I come put a nail at one end and then I put a nail at the other end on the black line. And here's where the ruler comes into play. My handy dandy straight edge metal ruler. You hold the ruler up against the edge, like so, and you put your thumb here and push back against the ruler. So the ruler is hitting on both ends, up against the ties. Now, this puts that right up against the ties, and the little hole right there is where you want it. Now, it may be a little bit off one side or the other, the black line. But we want the ties to be lined up against the metal edge. The black lines can vary a little bit. So this is, and this is true no matter where you lay track, if it's straight, you can use this technique. Get both ends mounted, hold it, and then the next thing is I take my track nails and my trusty dusty hammer, and I start putting the nails in. And... Since I'm by myself today, would be a good trick to show that one, since it takes both hands to do it. So we'll just let you figure out that you can tap the nails in. And of course, this is going into wood, so and it's soft wood, so it's no big issue about putting a little track spikes. So you end up with nice straight track. And we've taken our little track pad and polished it all up as we go. So when we get finished, we can take a vacuum cleaner, come over all this, and vacuum it. Then we're going to mount it up to the wall. Hmm. Okay. Down the road. Here we go. Okay, well, uh, we put down about as much track as we can do without m putting this thing in place. Uh, got to work the, the switch. We got a lot of switches. We've ordered a couple more we're going to need. But we're going to have to put this in place and figure out the connection. Because the further I can get the switches 
up here in this little section I'm going to have to build in. As far as the ladder, the more space you have for the storage at the end. So, uh, can't do that until everything's kind of like permanently where it's going to fall. So, at this point, the next step is going to be getting out underneath here and start on doing things that are there and put this in place. Okay, best laid plans of mice and men. Couldn't leave the braces on and then wedge the other one behind it. Uh just getting it up to the line and uh, on the wall to the same place where the other board was couldn't do it with the braces on so we took the braces off not a big deal we can go back and reattach them here but now we're getting the thing screwed to the wall and thought we'd had allowed for it but actually the studs have hit right where the cross members are so we're having to put the screws in on an angle so anyway uh, progress. We have it in place. A lot of screws to put in place and uh, crawling around on the floor and getting underneath this thing and doing it is uh, a project to say the least. By the way, uh, some basic principles here. <laughs> How do you lift this thing up and, and maneuver it and get it where you want to without a whole bunch of friends? People, simple principles here. It's called a lever. Put it on the 4x4s, built above it, and you can push, as you can see here, you get it on here. I can push, I can, when I, when I had all this set up, and I guess I could go back and shoot again, I can lever. This worked fine. My wife was actually being the lever operator while I put the screws in, so... There's always a way to skin a cat. So, it makes it, uh, instead of trying to muscle something around, and that, you know, that's quite a, or a piece of lumber and stuff to handle. The lever uh, worked just fine to get it up in the 4x4 four four blocks to build the lever pivot point on. Could have put a pivot point on the lever, but... You know, we really only had to make four or five moves to get it screwed up to the wall... So uh, I don't know if that would have been worth going to the trouble to figure out where I need the length of the pivot so, or the pivot point. So uh, it worked. So, And we're going to use a little bit more here to finish this off and get the few screws back in the wall. So there it is. Merry Christmas for you watching it. Uh, I know most of you will be after Christmas, but we'll get that one in. We always wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Okay, so here it is Christmas Eve. And... Uh, the bulk of this is installation of the additional staging yard is now completed. Uh, we did have to remove all the bracing pieces off of the second level. Um, the board they mount to in the back is exactly the same line, but some reason or another, everything just yeah, he couldn't slide it over. I think maybe that piece of wood may be a little bit bigger than the other one. So they wouldn't all fit on there. So we had to take them all off. And then uh, once we got the uh, new piece in to mount the braces to, we were able to do it. So now the brace is attached to this. Now you go underneath here. And you see we move the piece of one by two down to the bottom and all the bracing for this section hooks to that old piece. Vacuum cleaner and then we're going to get some things moved around. Uh, might have some people in here want to run trains here in a little while so I guess I can't talk too much today. And Merry Christmas again. Uh, 2018 version for uh, all those who watched this video down the road. Um, and we have the two tracks to work on the front. Got the rest of the switches and the re-railers. We're going to put the real re-railers in this time. So we've concluded the uh, woodworking part of this project. We've got the last piece framed in here. We may try to get a piece of cork. Uh, not going to come all the way with the sheet cork. We'll uh, take some regular cork like is used here. 
to make the transition so we can sand it down to get it to the right height as the uh, sheet cork, which is the rest of the way back. But anyway, this concludes the woodworking part of this whole project. And uh, we're not too far away from uh, getting some track switches and stuff tied in here. So, on to the next one. Okay, um, we're back now into putting the track down uh, and laying this out for the uh, switch lead. A couple of things here. We've gone ahead and glued some uh, regular cork type in. And uh, we put the, the white glue on it underneath. We cut it here to fit in in this switch. It's going to go in like so. I have to get a couple of things worked out as far as the uh, thing and where it goes exactly. And we just keep sliding back until we get it right. We'll cut, we'll figure this out later. We're going to disconnect that track right there back to that seam. And uh, when we get it all late, the switch in place, and I'll replace that piece of track, I think, with one whole piece. I think a three-foot section will cover it and eliminate one connection. But anyway, the key point here is right here, there's a brace. These machines are all going to be remote controlled. So you have to allow for where that wire is going to come up and where you're going to mount a tortoise machine underneath this layout. So that's first consideration. Uh, I'll show you examples where I know I have an issue. But this will work. I can get a machine in here if it's... I can come up to actually into right into this point right in here. Uh, but we're going to work on this exactly once we get the uh, other track out of the way. Very, very important not to make any kinks here uh, when making this connection. And that's uh, really, really uh, important. Uh, it's doing this kind of a situation where really can't get a good overhead look at this. Uh, you're going to have to be careful not to have a kink in uh, the way that the switch is connected to the existing track. So that's going to be something we're going to have to work on. I have a big mirror. Try to show that if I can where I'm going to use it to make sure the track, track does not have a kink in it. The other ends are easy because it, you can flex it out uh, as far as when you make your connection on the other end. N known problems. And these work great, by the way. I don't have them in the switches right now, but we spiked them because uh, I'm getting ready to move it. And I said before I move them, I want to show you the issue. Right here is the connection plate where I added on the last piece the the framed standard grid benchwork ends right here and all this was custom built into this triangle I know and I marked it when I was doing it between those two pencil marks there's all kind of things up underneath here that's gonna make trying to put switch machines for those two switches very difficult so, at this point in time, we'll have to give up some car space in the yard and move the whole thing south. Now, we'll reposition this and get it exactly on the marks. But basically, we slid the whole switch ladder down. I have to slide these over. These are Atlas 563, 564 switches. Lay this all out. Uh, like this they come out on two inch track centers that's what the black marks are two inch track centers so then once you get everything in place and straight you simply take a push pin and do that 
and you have it in place. Now, the other thing we'll do is we'll take this straight edge, again, valuable tool for laying track, and you put it in like so, right up against the throw throws on the switches, and you make sure all of them are touching, and they're all straight. You know, you get all your push pins in, you get everything lined up perfectly straight. There are more, many more steps to go on this before we can actually put the track down. We have to drill a hole for every switch machine. Uh, these are tortoises and they have to have a hole for the wire to come up through to uh, go back and forth. And this gets into some pretty precise measurements because when you deal with a lot of this big, things can get off real quick, real fast. So anyway, this is what we're up to today. And uh, we're going another step trying to get this thing to pour. The, the, the fun part on this whole project now, going forward, is going to be mounting the tortoise machines up underneath this layout. Okay, the next step here is to sand this cork off. Uh, the two places and the edges and so forth. So it's all level with the cork that's existing. We've removed the track uh, that was there. Uh, and we'll start sanding this off. I'll try to get this as we go. But uh, this is critical. As I said before, that little edge on that cork, if you're going to ballast track, uh, it, it causes big problems because it's going to cause you to uh, apply more ballast to cover that up. This edge has been sanded before, so that's nice and rounded. You're gonna you're gonna put glue on, or, or you're gonna stack your ballast up and then apply glue. You won't use anywhere near as much. Of course, now here we have the edge difference in height so we're going to sand the standard railroad track cork off to match that th thickness so and we'll feather that out so that there'll be a smooth transition okay um just for reference this is 60 grit sandpaper on the bottom of the orbital sander today <laughs> So you can see we get a lot of mess here, and the, the bag came off, but the bag wasn't catching anything anyway. Uh, not on this machine. I couldn't see as I was doing this, but we still got a little bit more to go here. Uh, got a little bit of an edge there, so uh, we'll get this worked out here and keep going and uh, come back to you. But this is sanding with the machine. You notice the edge is gone. Just that one pass with the 60 grit cuts off that edge real quick. Uh, you mainly want to run your hand across and make sure there's no edges, high spots here. Now, you say, okay, what about that big crack? In this case, once you put the switch on top, it won't show. The other thing is that if you're going to ballast, that would be filled up with ballast. Um... It just it works out real well. It's not a big issue. Uh, in this case, though, what we're going to probably do is come in here and paint this uh, on the edges black. I may go ahead and paint the top where the switch machine goes black because don't want to have to come back and take it out. And that gets into ballasting around switch machines, which we'll cover when we get there. 
Uh, the next thing we're going to do, of course, is vacuum. A must, people. Uh, this was bought on a Black Friday sale um, over 10 years ago. And uh, we got two, an extra hose, and we taped them together so we have two hoses. Big, long thing. And this is constantly in use around this railroad. It's, it's a must. Gotta have a vacuum cleaner. So here we go. And we'll leave you at that. I think you get the drift here. Okay, now we're able to uh, put the switch in place and lay the extra long, the straight track right over it. So that's exactly how we want it to play out. Okay, well, we've gotten our uh, track hooked back in over here. And we put the switch in place. Now, what we're doing is we're soldering the rails on here. We soldered it there, and we made sure the curve was consistently in radius. So we had no kinks. So it was soldered. Then, once we had the switch pinned down, we soldered that connection on. Then we went and made the connection back there. Uh, if you look this way, there is a, a curve out and a curve back in. That is not going to be an issue, but it keeps the radius through the switch consistent. Uh, with this railroad, that's no problem at all. This is 36-inch radius turn, so uh, we don't want kinks. Now, what I'm doing right now is making this piece that goes into where the first this is the track into the throat and what I want to do is solder this now ah, a little lesson in slot soldering can't have any paint on the rails okay no paint now you see the uh, stuff the gooey stuff that's flux right here this is a can of flux Let's see. There's the soldering paste. Whatever you, you can use, standard flux. But this is soldering paste. We we'll put some paste on the rails right there. Then we have our solder. Okay. Uh, this is kind of worn out. I'm sorry, but it's 6040 rising core solder. Oh, Radio Shack. Wow. Whoo. There was a scare back around the turn of the century, you know, 20th century to 21st, that they were going to outlaw or ban rising core of solder. California considers it a carcinogen. And believe me, I have enough solder to build a couple of railroads. So uh, I'm not running out. It's just things. But it's 60-40, and now you can get this solder, rising core solder. So we're going to heat up the soldering gun, and I have a 40-watt soldering iron here, right there, and it's heating up, and we're going to solder those joints, right, those two, and that'll be all the soldering we'll do at this time, because it makes the switch. We also drill the hole. Uh, there is a hole. Now, I put a ground throw there just for right now during construction uh, until I start doing all the switch machines but there is a hole drilled down underneath there you might be able to see it there's no light coming back up so it's not hard to see but before we put the switch in place we drill the hole use that drill bit uh, to put the hole well we used a double smaller one and then we went in with the bigger one to ensure there's enough room to place the wire in for the uh, tortoise machine into the little hole there. So the paste is on there. And the paste turns to a liquid and it makes the, the, the solder run.
Now, that joint's well soldered. Got to have a good hot soldering iron, gentlemen, for that paste to run in there and the solder runs with the paste. That's a good solder connection right there. Okay, one other thing here about soldering. Notice the nice little insulated or heat stand. Got to have this for safety, people. Uh, I religiously try to keep up with my soldering irons to make sure they're off. But I got to tell you, in 10 years, I have gone off and left one on. You got to have it in something to ensure it doesn't start a fire. The other thing, this is a 40-watt iron. When it gets hot, you don't have a problem with cold solder joints. I do not use a gun, okay? No guns around here. It's all soldering irons. So, uh... You got to play around and get a little education on soldering. You cannot have cold solder joints. If the solder doesn't run in and flow and then harden up, you're going to end up with cold joints and you'll find out real quick because the wires are all start coming on done. Just a little thing about soldering. The test run. First engine's over the uh, remodeled uh, additional staging yard. the 050 hand in here. Whoops. So our little switch installation works just fine. And we can come on back in here into the throat. It's about as far as we can go because none of these switches either have switch motors or ground throws on them. So they're just sitting there. And I'll guarantee you the oil engine will pick those switches in a minute. Okay, so one more test there. Got to have the acid test. About 40, 15 at the uh, shop. Okay, so why do you test things? And why do you test things with three axle trucks on diesels and then come back? and run multi-articulated steam engines over them because you find out things. Um, right here, where we went on to that piece of track, we found out the track was out of gauge. Uh, that's what you uh, have to have one of these little tools for. An animal ray track gauge right down there at the bottom. The thing was falling through and actually the front driver on the engine kept coming off so got to test things don't go too far down the road we had another piece of track there's the culprit that got pulled out and uh, it was about six inches of the track where it actually gotten pulled off of I didn't catch it the little plastic things and it was the thing was dropping through so there was too much space between the rails so it's why you test things so we come back here and that's all working fine now so we'll throw the tr switch come back here
and we'll run it forward. Got to be able to run backwards and forwards, people, with both directions. So check as you go. Okay, another little trick here. This switch goes right here. Uh, if we were to try to put a ground throw there, uh, if it was going to be done manually, that wouldn't work. So you have to have the device, the piece on the switch, right here, the throw. This needs to be over here. Now, on an Atlas switch, you can do this. All you have to do is you flip it over on the back, and you see the little tits. Well, I've already undone. I've already undone one. Number eleven Zacto blade. And this is good, one-handed here. Not recommending you try this one-handed. So I've lifted both the the little tits, the metal pieces off the the rubber tits. You see right there. Now I'm going to take the piece off, and that's what you see left over. Now all I have to do is take the piece, turn it around, and put it back in. This is strictly a manual proposition where you have to work this with two hands because you got to grab the uh, the points on the other side, and you got to slide the little metal piece back over that plastic uh it, but that's how you can fix an atlas switch so that it throws from the other side so our little piece is all put back on there you just have to get it from the other you have to flip it over now that the, the mounts on the other side and the little two plastic the little metal clips up over the plastic tit that's how it's all that it holds those points from moving, that's how it moves it back and forth. Okay, so there you go. little trick about Atlas switches. Okay, so now we got the rest of these switches. These are all where, these are the places where they're going to go. I've taken a marks a lot. And you can see here I've drawn the outside edges. I also took my straight edge. Move this out of the way. And we put it up against the, the throws so everything lines up. So you got good straight track. And I remember what I told you about the two inch track centers. Okay, see all this works out. Now, what I've done is I've taken my marks a lot, mm -mm, Sharpie, whatever, and I put the switch points right in the middle. And I put a dot on each side of the hole. And I've drawn a line where the throw bar is. Because right there where that little hole is in the middle of the throw bar, i got to go in there and drill a hole. Now, you know, got to move the switches and take it all out. But got to have a place to go identify where to put the switch to drill the hole for the tortoise um, wire to come up through for the throw in the machines. So that's what we're up to now. We're, we're, we're locating all the switches now. One thing you have to remember, don't want to put no switch machine right over that thing. You know, it runs all the way across. And of course, in this case, you can see the, the brace underneath. So you kind of want to make sure is to put a black marks on the here. You see, that's where it is. So you don't want to have that part right over that so we come down here same thing here we marked across here where the pieces are each one of them so in this case it's all 16 inches on center so not a thing but you don't want to have to fight putting a tortoise switch machine when the hole's right in the middle of a uh, member coming across or something else you put down underneath the layout so all these things you have to take into consideration when doing something like this. 
Yeah, there ain't no quick answer to any of this. You know, as you've seen, this project is now going on. Mm, what are we into? The third month, or and we're into another year. Gee, many crickets. January the second, two thousand and nineteen. Okay, so we can call this the one year anniversary. <laughs> Okay, moving ahead here. Okay, so we removed that switch. I'll go ahead and do this one. Uh, and we added the dot right in the middle. That's where we're going to drill that hole. So here's a drill. Now, this isn't the right size hole uh, for a tortoise machine. I at least, believe me, I use a much bigger one. But we have an issue here. Uh, we limited space. And we're not going to get that drill in between here. So what we're going to do is drill, and I strongly recommend doing this as a two-step process anyway. Get your drill squared up, and what you're seeing on the video and what is reality is not the same, so it's square. Drill your hole going through. Okay? Now, in this case... Uh, I'm going to have to go lay on the floor and drill from the bottom coming up to finish this process. Uh, mm, we won't make it. Okay, so we'll drill this from the bottom and uh, we'll show you the finished product. Uh, but we got to have that hole there for this tortoise switch machine. Alrighty, so be back in a minute. Okay, so uh, we drill the hole out bigger. Now, the one thing from the bottom, and we vacuumed and cleaned some of the mess up. One of the things you want to make sure of here, because, believe me, from experience, uh, anything gets in the way of that wire with a tortoise machine. A little piece of wood that the blade got stuck on. You want to make sure that hole is nice and cleaned out. There's not another cork or anything that sticks out. So you got a nice hole for that wire to come up and move the points back and forth. So now there's one other step I can do here. So now we know just exactly where to get the machine back because we have the switch back because we have uh, marked it and so forth. So we can put our push pin back in. Now we have a switch with a hole underneath it. And if you get, you can see, see the light in my, my ruler is right down there. You can see the ruler. So uh, now I'm going to do one more, say one more thing. If, if you're going to ballast all this, it's something that's say up in your main layout. Before you put that switch machine switch down and nail it, depending on what color ballast you're going to do, paint the area of the switch, the cork or whatever you use, plywood, styrofoam, whatever's there, homicide, paint it the color of the ballast before you permanently install the switch. That'll save you tons of labor later on. Because you're not going to want to put lots of ballast around switches. Um, it just makes life a lot simpler when you work in a model railroad. It's, you want to get the ballast for parents' sakes, but less, in this case, around switches is best. Also, before you try to ballast a switch, spray it with WD-40 first. <laughs> then the ballast doesn't stick to the track. All righty, see you later down the road. Well, like all model railroaders, we're always in a rush. <laughs> this project says, noted, it's been going on for quite a while. And one big part to the end of this is going to be installing. Mm, I'm not going to count it all up, but uh, about 13 tortoise switch machines and then doing the uh, mini panel to so it all works remotely 
mini panel and NCE, I've said it before, but it is basically an electronic diode bridge. So basically, when you come up here and you want to go to one track down here, you just push the button on the track and it'll set the switches so it'll flow into that track. We'll show you that, but I can tell you what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to end this as soon as we get all these tracks connected and hooked up. I'm going to end the video and set it up and, and do it. The installation of the switch machines, I've done that before in another video, part of it, uh, way back few many years ago. Uh, but the tortoise switch machines installation and setup in a mini panel, I think I'll make that a separate video. So anyway, this is just putting ground throws on uh, uh, to uh, make this work. And this is Caboose Industries 520-5202S 5-pack. These are the ground throws. This is the typical ground throw that's worked good with Atlas machines. Uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you could have done this all with uh, Pico machines, particularly if this is something you were going to do manually and you had easy access to throw these switches. When you get back over here for this, you have to understand this is only 28 inches off the floor. Uh, that last switch back there is a good 18 inches inside. Uh, that's not going to be something that's easily seen or thrown. So that's kind of why we're putting the tortoise machines in eventually. But in the meantime, this is going to do. Now, you have to go right here. And that hole right there in the middle is where the, the little tit on the uh, Caboose Hobbies ground throw is going to go. I already took my drill and drill that hole out uh, the way it comes right there that's the drill uh, the way this comes out of the box this little t tit won't fit in that hole so you got to drill it out a little bit uh, this I think is 564 drill bit so it's not very big and at this point also because the tit sticks down, and I don't like amputating things. You got to dig a little trough out in the cork for that little thing to run back and forth. Um, it's hard to see it on ones that I've done, but uh, take an X-Acto knife, and that's what I'm gonna do right now. Take the handy dandy X-Acto knife and uh, cut a hole out. X-Acto knife's down the other end. So we have the X-Acto knife in hand. And all we're going to do is go back underneath here, cut it out this way. Believe me, I'm looking in the camera trying to do it, and that really does not work. <laughs> and I think you understand what I'm doing. I'm just going to create a little trough for that tit to run back and forth in down there. And uh, so there'll be a place for the, uh, so it won't hang up on the cork. Okay, so we're going to do that, and then we'll get back to you here in a minute. Okay, so in this case, we've gotten some little screws out to uh, screw these in. Uh, instead of trying to get the nail thing with the track nails works, but it does cause some issues. So we uh, take the uh, thing and stick it in the hole. Okay, so now it's in the hole. Now, trick is... And get the drill out the way. You have to have this standing straight up. So it's in the centered position. Okay, we did one side. And, uh, well, we first of all, before we put the screw in it, we, we moved it back and forth, and I noticed that it was kind of sticking a little bit on the cork. Well, we ran the X-Acto knife in there, cleaned it out. So when I moved it back and forth, you see, and I can still move it, the, the points move real clean and there's no nothing, nothing hanging up. So, okay, we've got one screw in and we re made sure it's in the center position before we go drill a hole, start the next position, hole, uh, screw in. Okay, now one last step I do. You notice the two 
uh, track nails nailed in on the outside. Uh, one thing you do not want is people pushing the little handle all the way down. That is bad news because it forces too much pressure. Now, there is a little spring inside here that takes the pressure off. But if you get to where it gets, goes all the way down, then there's too much pressure over on the other on the point side. And then you start seeing the little, you see the brass show or the metal showing through on each side of that plastic. If that's not showing and it's going all the way over, then you're going over the little brass, the little plastic tit on the bottom of the Atlas thing that I showed you before. And then you're going to have problems with your cars because then the wheel's going to start bouncing up when it hits that plastic and then it won't work on the points. So anyway, this is basically a completed installation now, at least temporarily till we get around to putting the machine in. So because we don't plan on doing a whole lot of scenery work or ballasting over here, um, we did have to modify one of the switches. I had to take my wheel and literally cut off no, uh, where is it? This got cut off. Okay, that piece got cut off because again, two-inch track centers. Uh, the left and okay, this is a uh, left. This is a right. So the left and the right switch won't go together like this. They'll go together if it's two rights and two lefts for a crossover. But to, to come back like this, I had to cut this piece of track off, and then I made it the cut to where this switch is on two inch centers. The idea here is we're going to put another switch in down here and put a couple of tracks uh, from engines to park in. Or you could go ahead because it's kind of visible and you could scenic the whole thing for a small engine for terminal or whatever. Down there where you see the white is where the little board's going to go for the push buttons to control all the switch machines. So here we go. Uh, we're going to put some engines into the yard and see how all this works with some the trains. This is one of our coal trains. This is the empties. You go to the New River Mine up there and you get the foals and you bring them back. And of course, we make you go the long way on this railroad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is the empty coal train. And uh, we're going to stop here and uh, Okay, so we're shooting this real time here. No test runs. So if it goes on the floor, it's a track or on the ground. Guess what video you'll never see. <laughs> Great part about editing video. Hey, take all the oopses out. Okay. Like that SP caboose on a BN engines, huh? Okay. So all seems to be working fine. Yeah, knock on wood. Boom, boom. Hit my knee on the thing. So. AC CW 4400, whatever. Those are inner mountain engines. Okay, so all goes well on our first uh, test here. So we're going to call this a wrap on this project. 
Uh, we're missing, we're going to put a couple of switches in here. So we'll have a place to maybe park a couple of engines or some cabooses. There is a runaround track, escape track, not a runaround. We're missing a switch here. We'll make that bit like that. But we'll have another switch there to where the train can, in like that coal train, could pull in, drop the cars. The engines can fall fit up that one section of track. And then they can escape coming down the outside track. But that's about the only things left to do. So we're going to call this a wrap, see if we can uh, put it all together, edit it, and put it on the thing. We do have to drill a couple of holes down there. And like I said, we'll mount the switches up and put the mini panel in. When we do that, we'll make it a separate video. The holes are drilled for the tortoise switch machines. They're all there. So uh, it's been fun. Uh, good addition to the railroad. And uh, it'll free up some space for some people when they're making up trains in the other yard because that will give them some uh, arrival departure tracks. And uh, we'll keep plugging away here. And this has been another Grande Pacific production.